coasts are dynamic ecosystems that have always been dynamic and really need to be dynamic in order to survive. Coastal ecosystems, places like tidal marshes, dunes, barrier beaches, mangrove forests, they're important for a lot of reasons. They're important for wildlife, recreation, the economy, but they're also important because they provide natural barriers. And we need to be thinking proactively about how we're going to manage and conserve them as the conditions in the environment continue to change. Powerful waves, gale force winds, torrential rain. Storms have always presented a challenge to life on the coast. And while it's impossible to calculate the full impact of extreme weather on people's lives, the financial costs have been staggering. In 2017 alone, coastal storms cost the U.S. economy over $100 billion. You have more and more people actually wanting to live near the coast. Then you have sea level rise occurring. And then in addition, we're starting to see either more frequent or more intense storms. This area has experienced storms and rain and has adapted to it. What we've never seen before, at least we didn't see it coming, is sea level rise. Water levels came all the way up to here. I mean, it was nutty. We're already beginning to see changes along the coast as a result of sea level rise. We're seeing marshes that were once thriving and healthy starting to disappear because of chronic inundation and erosion. We're seeing islands that were in really important seabird nesting sites eroding away. You know, if we lose this island, the birds are going to lose the nesting habitat. So there isn't that, you know, other spot that the birds can easily go to and, and pick a new home. At least 40% of the U.S. coastline is experiencing erosion. Every year, 19,000 acres of saltwater wetlands are lost, the equivalent of almost 40 football fields disappearing every day. What rising sea level tells us is that all of the coastal issues that we're dealing with right now in regards to storm vulnerability, coastal erosion, and habitat loss are only going to increase in the future. If you look up and down the East Coast, and especially the Mid-Atlantic, development pressures and humans' impact really has created an environment where it's not in harmony with the natural changing environment. According to the Census Bureau, the population in coastal counties has nearly doubled in the last 60 years. Today, almost one in three Americans, over 91 million people, live along the coast. We've filled in, paved over, built on top of these productive ecosystems, and in many cases, we've replaced them with highly vulnerable and exposed communities. When we decide to you know, develop on the coastline, or when we decide to get rid of a marsh. We're not just building over these natural defenses, but we're also building in areas that are inherently very risky. Our hearts go out to the families who have lost loved ones. You know, their world has been torn apart. Our focus will continue to be public safety. Jersey shore of my youth is gone. When Hurricane Sandy happened, the total damages that it caused are estimated to be around $50 billion across 12 states. In our study, we found that the marshes that currently exist along the northeastern coast of the U.S. Uh, prevented $625 million in damages during Hurricane Sandy. Because of this, a lot of people are beginning to realize that these are actually natural defenses, that these actually provide an economic value. The more wetland that you have in front of your property, your road, your infrastructure, the less wave energy there's going to be. Coastal ecosystems act as natural barriers, 
providing storm and flood protection by absorbing wave energy and lowering wave height. Just 30 feet of marsh can absorb 50% of wave energy, and coral reefs can reduce that energy by up to 97%, slowing waves down and causing them to break offshore. I like to think of these ecosystems as nature's speed bumps. All of those systems are causing that wave energy to have to slow down so that hopefully by the time it reaches farther inland, maybe to people's houses or to roads, the waves do not have as big an impact. Maybe it doesn't flood as far or it doesn't flood as much if it's a very big storm, or maybe it doesn't flood at all. Traditionally, projects designed to address storm and flood protection have relied on built infrastructure, like seawalls, jetties, groins, or riprap. But installing or restoring natural infrastructure can provide more cost-effective storm protection while conserving habitat and improving biodiversity. A seawall only provides one benefit, storm protection, and it provides that benefit really only when a storm is approaching. Natural infrastructure, by contrast, is actually providing a whole host of co-benefits, including habitat, water quality, carbon sequestration, perhaps recreation opportunities, and it's providing them all the time, all year round. Built infrastructure was designed for very specific conditions, and it doesn't change, it can't grow, for example, as sea level rise occurs. Natural infrastructure, on the other hand, can grow in many cases and keep pace with sea level rise. So oyster reefs, for example, and marshes and mangroves and coral reefs can keep pace with sea level rise as it's occurring. Those ecosystems have been doing that for hundreds or thousands of years. Armed with this knowledge, a diverse mix of individuals, agencies, and institutions are coming together to improve resiliency and protect habitats and communities on the coast. At Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge, the Fish and Wildlife Service are working with a host of partner organizations to respond to sea level rise that's led to over 5,000 acres of lost tidal marsh. I've worked for the federal government for a long time. I've done a lot of planning exercises, but this is hands down the most productive uh, and important planning exercise that I've ever been involved in. In Stratford Point, Connecticut, Audubon staff are partnering with Sacred Heart University on a unique living shoreline installation that employs reef balls to limit wave damage and restore habitat. To you know, have see these reef balls get put in and to really see this salt marsh establishing behind them, uh, you know, I, I definitely think that's success. And in Delaware, the Prime Hook National Wildlife Refuge has recently completed one of the largest ecosystem restoration projects ever undertaken on the East Coast recovering thousands of acres of lost beach and marsh while protecting the local community from increased flooding and storm surge. We restore the system to a better condition, all these other benefits come from it. If all this is important to us, then you know you need to invest in that. In addition to innovative restoration projects that rely on grants, state, or federal funding, there is legislation already in place that protects people and ecosystems without spending money to do it. Well, the Coastal Barrier Resources Act was one of the most important pieces of bipartisan conservation legislation ever passed in the U.S. It was a pretty simple recognition that there are areas of our shorelines that were so absolutely exposed to coastal hazards and future sea level rise that having federal support for development there just simply didn't make sense. You can see the difference between areas that are protected under the CBRA and those that aren't. You'll see a protected parcel that is within the CBRA, it's still pristine. You cannot build roads with Department of Transportation money. You can't get HUD money for housing, you can't get the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, and you're not eligible for FEMA in the event of a disaster. At present, the system includes 3.5 million acres. As of 2013, 
it was estimated that the Coastal Barrier Resources Act had saved over $9 billion in federal expenditures. What we should absolutely continue to do as we have sea level rise is remove any incentives for people to move to areas that will be impacted. The good news is there are solutions for improving coastal resiliency. Congress could act to expand the coastal barrier resources system by adding more areas, including places inland and upland that will be impacted by sea level rise, and federal and state and local officials could fund projects that focus on nature-based solutions for storm protection. Where they still exist, we should be putting a high priority on making sure we are protecting existing ecosystems. And where there are degraded systems, we want to be prioritizing restoring those systems as well. If we do nothing, I think that the kinds of news stories we see after hurricanes like Harvey or Florence or Superstorm Sandy, that those are just going to become more and more the norm. It's up to us to act. It's up to us to ensure that habitat is sustained on the landscape over time in the face of sea level rise. I'm optimistic about the outlook, but we need to begin now to actively improve the resilience of coastal habitats and ensure that those habitats persist on the landscape. We can't build our way out of this problem. It's gonna require working with and investing in our natural systems in order to have long-term meaningful protection for the wildlife and people across our coast.